There's not a person in here, John Donlan, that can't say amen to that. <laughs> I, I sure can, that is for sure. So I'm thankful for that scripture reading and that little testimony so much. Um, that's what we do with each other. You know, when I get asked to speak, and it's not a ton, but when I get asked to speak somewhere else other than my uh, normal Sunday morning, if I get assigned a topic, that's okay, or a passage of scripture, that's okay, but I like it best when they say, whatever you want to speak on, you can speak on that. And so what I revert to then always, and I always tell other guys who ask my opinion or young guys in the ministry, the same thing. I always think the place to go during times like that is what's simmering in your life at that moment. I, I say whatever is on the front burner of your life simmering at that time, uh, you could trust that'd probably be a good place for you to develop something and speak on that. So what you're going to get this morning here for the next few minutes is something that is definitely simmering in my life right now. What you're really going to get is, <clears throat> pardon me, um, you're going to get me processing this out loud some or hearing how I've been processing it. You're going to hear maybe what could come across as some disjointed notes of me writing a lot and trying to figure out how I can preach this or share this. But foremost, how does this get into my soul and what does this look like? He just has me here right now. It's in the book of Jonah. And I got there because there are a few different prayer books that I like to use uh, throughout the day, mornings, and sometimes pull them out. Uh, some are just scriptures that just lead you through different topics of prayer. Uh, my favorite is called the Valley of Vision, which is a collection of Puritan prayers. I can't recommend it enough. When our resource center reopens, they're up there. Hopefully that's going to reopen soon. Uh, I, I recommend those a lot. They're precious uh, for praying yourself and reflecting on. But this one particular morning, uh, one of the prayer books that I was in started leading me through some texts in the book of Jonah that I began to pray, and it just kind of gripped me and hasn't let me go since, uh, to the point that uh, when I'm maybe between my appointments or in a waiting room somewhere, I've been opening my phone and reading Jonah and reading Jonah and reading Jonah and writing and meditating and thinking. And um, I think most everyone in the church is familiar with the story of Jonah, and I would even say probably a whole lot of unsafe people who don't believe the Bible necessarily are familiar with the story of Jonah. It's a favorite children's story, and if nothing else, uh, they're familiar with the fact that he was in the belly of a big fish for three days. Uh, it, it, it's not an unknown or kept secret uh, at all outside of the church to unbelievers, but to us, I know it's quite familiar. Uh, the lessons in the book of Jonah uh, are pretty obvious it doesn't take a lot of uh, theological training or study to start recognizing, as you just read through the book, some of the lessons. Uh, but what I found, uh, the more I meditate and read and, and get into it, is that when you plumb into the depths of Jonah, it almost feels bottomless. And those lessons that are obvious and powerful might just be on a surface level, but when you go a little deeper, there, there is a richness to this little four-chapter book that has amazed me and I, I, I've never seen before, and I've read it a lot. Uh, it's essentially a memoir of this man's life, uh, Jonah. You know, a memoir, which are some of my favorite reads, are different than biographies or autobiographies. A memoir is usually like a snapshot or a section uh, in someone's life that they write about, rather than their entire life, though they may refer to that, they're really focused on this. And so this is sort of a memoir in the life of one of the prophets of the nation of Israel that's just a little part of his life. It's a four-chapter book. And it's still to this day extremely important to the Jewish people, uh, especially Orthodox Jews. As a matter of fact, Yom Kippur is uh, one day of the year. It's the most important holiday on the Jewish calendar. It's the Day of Atonement. It's a 25-hour uh, holiday where they fast from eating and drinking for 25 hours. 
Uh, they don't bathe. They don't wash their hair. They don't allow themselves perfumes or lotions on their skin. They don't even put leather on their skin because it's a sign of, of richness or prosperity. It's a, a 25-hour communal time of reflecting on sin and grief over sin and repentance. And when that 25-hour period of time begins to draw to a close, they read out loud together the book of Jonah, the entire book. Because this book shows the, the heart of man and the character of God as clearly as anywhere else in the, <clears throat> pardon me, in the scriptures. I mean, it truly is a study on man. And it truly is a revealing of the character of God. If you didn't know anything about God or man and all you had was the book of Jonah, you'd have enough. You really would have enough. So it's an extremely important book to the Jewish nation. It's become more important to me, and so I'm just going to share a little bit with you about this book. Thumbnail sketch, just a little bit of it I want to remind you of, or at least highlight for you, is that Jonah was a prophet in Israel. We don't know hardly anything about his life. The Midrash, Jewish writings, uh, seems to think, or, or speculates anyway, that Jonah was that young boy that Elijah raised from the dead. I love to think that's true, but there's no evidence of that. <laughs> but when I read it, I thought, I'll go with that, because I just think that's a cool story. <laughs> and so we don't know really much at all about his life, but he was a prophet, and there came a time where the Lord came to him and said, I want you to go to the city of Nineveh and preach judgment and repentance. That's, that's what he asked him, judgment and repentance to the city of Nineveh. And Jonah didn't even hesitate. He turned and ran from that call without hesitation. As a matter of fact, the exact text in Jonah chapter 1 says that he turned and, quote, ran in the opposite direction, end quote. Now, if there ever is a description of what rebellion and sin is in all of the Bible, that's about as clear as it gets right there. To sin is to turn and run in the opposite direction. It's not always a physical running and turning like Jonah did, though certainly it can be. It can be a turning and a running uh, in your mind, the opposite direction that you know God wants you to go. We know that the Nineveh of the mind, right, where God tells Jonah to go, where God tells us to go, is purity. And so when we see that pretty woman, though, and she walks by, if we want to obey and go to Nineveh, we turn our head, we avert our eyes, we capture our thoughts, and we move on. To look at her and to dwell and to lust is to turn and run the opposite way, like Jonah did. We're runners, too. It, it's too easy for us, I think, in scriptures, but especially a guy like Jonah to look at that and say, well, that was the stupidest thing I've ever seen. Run from God, you ain't going to run from God. We're runners, too. If Nineveh is to love your enemies and forgive those who wrong you and to do good to those who seek to do you harm, if that's Nineveh, then we turn and run when we refuse to offer forgiveness when we refuse to go the extra mile, or give them our coat when they ask for our shirt as well. We run from Nineveh when we're like that. We're runners like Jonah. When God said to him, here's where I want you to go, and here's what I want you to do, without hesitation, he turned and ran from God. The text tells us that he wanted to go to Tarshish. Now, it may have been his hometown, but I think more importantly is that was almost 3,000 miles away from Nineveh. I think what we learn more than anything is, as Jonah thought, I'm getting as far away from this place as I possibly can. Now listen, that's like if God told one of you, I want you to go to Nokomis Beach and preach, and you got in your car and headed to Seattle. So I am not only not going to Nokomis Beach, I'm out of here to the farthest corner away from this area I can possibly get. I'm, all, I'm gone. <clears throat> Pardon me. I'm out of here. 
the Bible says in Jonah chapter 1 that he was trying to, quote, escape the presence of the Lord, end quote. How, how foolish is that? He thought he could. Um, David wrote in Psalm 139, where shall I go from your spirit or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in Sheol, there you are. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me shall be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light to you. You don't get away from God. We probably don't in our conscious awareness, think to ourselves, I'm going to run from the presence of God now. But when we live out of touch of the awareness of the presence of God and run from Nineveh, we're thinking we're running from his presence, and you're not. When you woke up, he was with you. He's with us in this room. He'll be with you in your car when you leave. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. He's there when you said that. He was right beside you when you posted that. Uh, he's present when you gave your wife that big hug and encouragement and prayed with her. He's with you. He's with you. He's with you. We don't get away from God. The text tells us that Jonah was seeking to escape the presence of God, and so to do so, he bought a ticket for a voyage to Tarshish. And when he got on that boat, apparently he went and found a corner to go to sleep, and that's what he did. In my view, another sign of escape. Used to be one of my favorites. Um, once the voyage began, and they got far enough out that land wasn't in sight, we're told that a violent storm uh, came out of nowhere, and the storm was so violent, the text tells us twice, that it threatened to break apart the ship, and Jonah was sleeping through it. I have a son that can sleep through a storm like that, by the way. <laughs> yeah. The sailors aboard that ship were veteran, salty, old uh, crewmen. And we're told that they were chilled to the bone with fear at this storm. They couldn't control the ship. They didn't know what to do, and they panicked. Now, in those days, whatever region you were from, there was a local god, a small g god. And we're told that all of these different guys began to cry out to their god, to their idol, for help and answers and, and some solace and nothing was happening and finally they recognized there was one person that wasn't on deck with them that they know was somewhere and they found him and they woke him up and they absolutely shook him and exclaimed to him what is wrong with you how can you sleep through this don't you have a god we're crying out to our gods why don't you cry out to your god and when jonah uh, was asked who are you jonah said i am hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the land. Now, that was his answer. I am a Hebrew. Now, I'm not going to unpack that, but there is so much depth to that that he exclaimed, that he said to these guys with that ship rocking around, right? Storm, waves coming over the side, everybody's scared to death, and he says, I'm a Hebrew. I belong to Yahweh. I worship Yahweh, the God of heaven and of these seas and of the land. And they said to him, well, then cry out to your God. Can you cry out to your God and do something about this? We're about to die. And Jonah said to the sailors as they were uh, completely and totally terrified that he was the cause of this storm. That's a very important phrase or, or statement in this text as well. He said, I'm the reason this storm is raging. And they said, then what should we do? And he said, throw me overboard, and the storm will grow calm. That happens to be a phrase that I just have not been able to get away from. I'm the cause of this storm. And what it tells us, I think, something that I think all of us know from our individual lives, we've been guilty of it maybe, or we've been a part of it, is that we don't sin in isolation. You never can sin in isolation. When you sin, you're going to drag those closest to you into the storm with you. 
When you sin, it is not without effect <clears throat> upon those who are around you, your family, your friends, your co-workers, your church, whatever it is. You drag other people into the storm with you, and there is great effect on their life. There is no way you will run from Nineveh in a rebellious way and keep running from Nineveh without it having a traumatic storm-like effect upon those closest to you and around you. Remember when God, under the leadership of Joshua, gave the city of Jericho into the hands of the Israelites. They marched around, the walls came down. And God told Joshua, head in and fight them, you're going to win. And they headed in, and one of their skirmishes, a lot of the Israeli men were killed. And when the battle was over, they essentially had their butts handed to them. And Joshua tore his clothes and, and was carrying on with God a little bit, sharing his heart, said, what's going on here? You told us to do this. You told us we were going to win this. You told us we'd be victorious. And God says, you remember what else I told you? I also told you don't let anyone take any of those possessions or belongings in Jericho. I want all of them destroyed. I'm devoting all of them to destruction. Don't let anybody do it. There's sin in your camp, Joshua. And the next morning, Joshua got up, and he grabbed some of the leaders, and they went from tribe to tribe and tent to tent until they came to a guy named Achan's tent. And it became known to Joshua by the Lord, and Joshua said to Achan, what have you done? And essentially, Achan said, I know we were told not to take any of these possessions, but when I saw some of this gold, when I saw some of this clothes, when I saw some of this silver, I could not say no to it. I thought, what a waste for this to be destroyed, so I took some. And Joshua's words were, do you know what you've brought upon this people? You don't sin, and there be just a storm in your life only. Your, your sin, your taking these possessions, has cost the life. There are women who have lost their husbands. There are children who have lost their, their daddies because you've done this, and as a result, Joshua took Achan, and the Bible says, all of his sons and all of his daughters, and brought them into the valley of Achor, and took all of those possessions that he stole and gathered around them, and the nation of Israel stoned them and lit them on fire, and they all were consumed because of it. You don't sin in isolation. And if there's a warning that comes from this text in Jonah that rings in my head and I hope will ring in your head is I think some of the most difficult, humbling, devastating words that you may have to ever speak to your wife or your children or, or your church or whoever else is this storm is raging because of me. I'm the cause of this storm. It's a good warning from Jonah. So they threw Jonah overboard, and just as he said, happened. The storm absolutely grew completely calm when he, they did that. And it freaked in a good way the sailors who were on board because the storm ended, but the storm really just began for Jonah. As God had put a big fish under that boat, it doesn't say whale, it just says great fish, probably a whale, whatever it was, a great fish. And that great fish swam and just consumed Jonah and took him into his stomach where, amazingly, he spent three days. Three days. Now, what do you learn about that? What you learn about that is that man is so hard-hearted and stubborn. He didn't repent. And you read this sentence or this, this prayer of repentance in Jonah 2. I couldn't recommend it more. We usually, if, if you're like me, when I'm... When my sin's finding me out and I'm in a time of confession, I run to Psalm 51 and I read through that thing slowly, you know, David's confession, but give Jonah 2 a try one time because here's Jonah after three days cramped in the cavity of a whale soaked in bile juices and finally after three days relents and repents and prays a beautiful prayer. Three days, three days, think about it. What was, I'd love to know, I think I'll ask you when I get to heaven, what were you thinking for two and a half of those days? <laughs> what were you thinking? I'm not going to Nineveh, I'm not doing it, I'm, I'm, I'm fine in this stomach. You want me in this stomach? I'm fine in this stomach, no problem, I can do that. 
But after those three days, and he prayed and he repented, then God had that great fish puke him up on the beach, and that's where he found himself, and he decided, I better listen, and so he went to Nineveh. I believe in my heart, begrudgingly, but he went and he preached. Nineveh was a great city, a big city, but it was an evil city. It was a city that was filled with Gentiles. It was filled with immorality and idolatry, and Jews not only hated the city, they hated every single inhabitant of the city. This is one of the reasons that he didn't want to go. Again, the Midrash says, and I think this makes sense, that during the days of Jonah, his own people Israel were not repenting of their sins. So I think not only did he not want to go to Nineveh because he hated their guts and he didn't want them to hear the good news about God, but he was scared to death that they would repent and his own people weren't repenting. How would it look for 120,000 people, which was the population of Nineveh, how would it look for 120,000 people to repent and come to God and God's own chosen people won't come to God? I think these things were going on in his mind as he went into the city and we're told that he preached from one end of the city to the other and all 120,000 people of that city, the Bible says, came to God in repentance and sorrow over their sin. I'll tell you as a preacher... Any other preacher would have been given to pride and thrilled to preach and have 120,000 people come to Jesus. You, you, you preach and have one person come to the Lord, you're walking on air the rest of that week, if not for a very, very long time. Jonah was not walking on air, and he was not happy about it. He was aggravated, and he was ticked. And he actually said to God, this is why I didn't want to go there. And, and, and you can say it in a funny way. It sounds a little bit funny, but... It's so sad and so revealing to the heart of man when Jonah essentially said, see, I know you're this kind of God. I knew you would do this. This is why I didn't want to go here. This is the kind of God you are, and look what you did. This is why I ran. I should have stayed in the belly of that fish. It would have nothing to do with the city of Nineveh, those dog, pagan, Gentile, idolaters, to repent while his own people laid in their rebellion and sin. There's so many lessons in this great book, but one that really came to me as I began to look a little bit deeper into this book is that there is a Hebrew word that's used three different times uh, in chapter 1, Yahru. If you want to know, just out of curiosity, the Hebrew word is pronounced Yahru. And let me read for you the three different times it's used because it's translated in three different ways. The first one is in verse 9 where they asked Jonah on the ship, who are you? And Jonah said, I am a Hebrew and I worship Yahru. I worship Yahweh. I worship. That's what the word is translated of there, worship. The very next word, or the next verse, it says, the sailors were terrified. Same Hebrew word, yahru. They were terrified. And then when you look down in verse number 16, after Jonah was thrown overboard and the the storm calmed, it says that the sailors were awestruck. Yahru, there it is, awestruck. So in the same chapter, same Hebrew word, translated in three different ways, worship, terrified, awestruck. Three very different words. There's some relation between the last two, but really no. Three very different words. Now, why is the one word translated and come out in English in three different ways? Well, in the Hebrew language, in the Hebrew's writings of the Old Testament, there is a word that can mean different things depending upon the context. So, We might say that a woman can get a run in her stockings, if they still wear stockings, I don't know, but a woman can get a run in her stockings, or a baseball team can score a run, or a man can go out on a run. Same word, three different contexts, looking different, however. Well, the same thing is true for Hebrew. There is different ways that you can translate that word, yahru, and we see it there as worship and terrified and awestruck. So when I discovered this, I began to think and wonder, um, why, who is it, or how can I be made to experience in my affections worship, terror, and awe 
from one person or one thing or one situation. Is there anyone or anything that can arouse in me worship, terror, and awe? I can think of a lot of things that can do each one of those things. We can easily get, be given to worshiping a person or a sports figure or a boat or whatever else, giving it what it doesn't deserve, but we could be moved to worship those kind of things. There's all kinds of things that can scare me to death, and I can stand at the edge of the Grand Canyon and feel some awe and reverence inside of me, but what is it about this word, what is it about God that is the one who can do this? How is it that God is able to create in me this whole um, idea of Yahru and its meaning? And Jonah answers this thing about God in a way that reveals who God is, that when you see God for the way Jonah tells us about God, it almost feels natural to worship him and to be afraid of him and to be in awe of him. Because when he says to God, you know, I, I knew you were going to do this. This is why I didn't want to go there. This is why I was running away to Tarshish. I knew, and here comes a quote, I knew that you are a merciful and compassionate God, slow to get angry, filled with unfailing love, and how you are eager to turn back from destroying people. Isn't that an amazing description of God? And so where does the worship and awe and terror come from? What well, it starts with what he called him. He called him Yahweh. I knew that you are a Yahweh. I knew that you are Yahweh. Now that's the proper name of God. That's the highest sacred name of God. That's the name with which God revealed himself to Moses in Exodus 3 when God finally twisted Moses' arm enough to say, go, go confront Pharaoh and get my people out of there. And Moses said, he's probably going to want to know what your name is. What should I tell him? And God said, well, if he asks, you tell him I am sent you. I am. That's Yahweh. I am. What the heck? I am. I am, right? Imagine Moses hearing that for the very first time. I am. Oh, you want me to go and say, when they say, who's telling you to do this? Just look at him and say, I am is telling me? Yeah, tell him I am that I am. What that means is I am the self-existent one. I am dependent upon no one and nothing for my existence. The only one. Now, only that being can move me to worship and terror and awe at the same time. At the same time. Yahweh. And then he says, you're merciful. Now, this is a Hebrew word that's only used for God. In all of the Old Testament, it means this free bestowal of kindness um, on someone who can't earn it or can't do anything to get it. It's a kindness given. And then he said, you're compassionate. This Hebrew word is only used of God, and that speaks of a character that is moved so easily to pity and forgiveness. And then he says, you're slow to anger. That word slow means just what it it sounds like, but in the Hebrew, it means a long, 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 long time. We might say it this way. I don't have the best-looking anger, but I have a really long fuse. What, what Jonah is saying is you have a long fuse to your anger. Interesting, the word anger in the Hebrew, Hebrew, which is such a, a picturesque language, means nose or nostrils. That's what the word means. And, and just picture a, a horse. I've seen deer get this way. Or even us or an old man, when you start to get angry, what do you do? That's what it means. And Jonah says, it takes a long, long, long time to get your nostrils flared. And then he says, you're filled with unending love. Filled means overflowing and abundance. And that word love is the Hebrew word hesed. Anybody remember me speaking about hesed last year and months ago? I've, I've been immersed in the Hebrew understanding of the Old Testament. It's so fascinating to me. And that word hesed is so hard to define. You really can't in English. You know the best way to understand it is it's God's unchanging loyalty to those he's in a covenant with. He cannot be moved in his loyalty to me and to you. He'll never move away from that. And then it says he's... Jonah says, you're eager to turn back from destroying. Um, that word um, literally means to console oneself. So fascinating to me. I mean, think about that. 
you, you console your, yourself, you're eager to console yourself from bringing about destruction, destroying, devastation. The word literally means evil. Bringing about evil, destruction, harm, devastation. What did Job say when his friends were acting foolishly? He said, shall we accept good from the Lord and not evil also? That's a, that's a, that's a, cons- a disconcerting verse. It doesn't mean evil in the sense of something coming from Satan, but he means it in the sense of destruction and devastation. And what Jonah is saying here, you console yourself so long before you give way to destruction and devastation. That's like if somebody says something to you at work and you get ticked off or you're bothered or something happened and rather than explode, what do you do? You go, all right, take a deep breath, Tony. Just take a deep breath. Walk away. They probably didn't mean it. They're probably having a bad day. What am I doing? I'm consoling myself and... What Jonah is saying about God is you are given to destroying and bringing devastation upon people, but you console yourself for such a long, long, long time. In other words, this isn't tops on your list. This isn't what you want to do. And we know from so many Old Testament passages that I don't have time to go to that God has a a hair trigger on love and compassion and has said, and it takes him a long time time to get to a point where he'll unleash devastation upon people because of their sin but we should note from Jonah that he will unleash devastation on people when they rebel and run from Nineveh it reminded me of what Paul said in Romans chapter 11 as I've meditated on this when Paul says in in Romans 11 take note of the kindness and the severity of God kindness to you provided that you continue in his kindness and severity towards those who have fallen away. There is a kindness and a severity uh, to God. And Jonah reveals this God, and when he does, the Yahru should be aroused in us where it, how, how can we not fall to the ground in awe and in worship and also have in us, I'd put it this way, a smattering of fear and terror before him. How can you not? If you think that's inappropriate, almost always when I preach that, somebody writes me or somebody talks to me and says, no, we shouldn't feel that way about God. Well, I don't know about that. You know, the Greek word translated fear in the New Testament is phobos, P-H-O-B-O-S. Guess what English word we get? Phobia. The New Testament writers say, in, in our way of thinking, we should be phobic about God. There should be a fear. When Peter saw his sins, what did he say? Get away from me. When Isaiah was caught up into the throne room to see God in Isaiah 6, what did he say? I am so unclean. I am an unclean mouth. I live around people. I am undone. There's this terror. There's this awe. There's this worship when we realize that we have a God who extend has said to his people, who enters into a covenant and becomes so loyal that nothing can move me out of that covenant. He gives me kindness, benevolence, love, compassion, mercy, grace. He loves to be that God to his people, but yet he will discipline those he loves. He will get a hold of those he loves. He's not above bringing about devastation and putting you in the belly of a fish until you learn, until you get to where he wants you to get. So these are some of my outworkings in just a little bit of this, this book. This is a little bit of what I've been writing and thinking about. And so I thought, Last night as I was laying in bed, I changed how I wanted to end this two or three times, and here's where I landed. How do I end this? Well, what I would say to you is I think out of this, one thing we should consider is becoming like a Ninevite. Jonah hated them. I see in them a people to emulate. Because Jonah tells us that when Jonah walked through that city preaching judgment and repentance and preaching about God's goodness and his grace and mercy and compassion and how he would forgive them if they would repent and turn from their sins and turn from their evil. You know what we're told in the book of Jonah? Every person in the city took off their clothes and put on sackcloth and sat in ashes and mourned and grieved and wailed over their sin. And then we're told that the king believed Jonah. You know what it says the king did? Took off his royal robes and put on sackcloth and sat in ashes and mourned over his sin. And you know what he did? He issued an edict for the entire 
city of Nineveh, and listen to what he said, everyone better have sackcloth on, everyone better be mourning and grieving and repenting over their sins. And then he added this, I even want you to put sackcloth on all the animals of Nineveh. And I think something we should carry out of this is that there ought to be seasons in our life where we become Ninevites and just bow before him and get broken over our sin. Worship with awe. Worship with terror. Thankful for forgiveness. Asking for the grace of repentance. Because not only can we end up in the belly of the fish, we can drag so many people that we love into a horrifying, violent storm with us. There's much to consider out of Job. So I thought we'd take a minute and just let you bow your heads and close your eyes and just maybe ask the Lord if there's anything in you that you need to put some sackcloth on about. And you can repent, and he so promised us that he's going to forgive us if we confess it. So take a little bit of time and do that right now. Father, search our hearts to see if there's anything unclean in us right now. Please, in, in Jesus' name, we come together communally as, as men who belong to you. And we want to know it, so show us right now, Lord. Father, would you refresh or maybe begin a view of sin that you have in our life? Would you elevate the seriousness of sin? Would you communicate to us your hatred of it and how it arouses your justice? And would you give us a fresh, fresh view of a merciful, compassionate, loving, grace-giving, slow to anger, eager to relent from disaster, benevolent, kind God. Oh, Father, root out the evil in our lives. Root out the evil of our lives and indeed make us like you made Nineveh. Make us men who hate sin and when it comes we acknowledge it, we, we face it, we hate it, we grieve over it, we turn from it, we change our mind about it, we agree afresh with you about it and we walk away. Oh Lord, we, we pray for holy, upright lives for the men that are in this room right now. We pray for a pure worship. We pray for a commitment to godliness. We pray for a, a compulsion to abide in Christ. That we might bear fruit, more fruit and much fruit, to the glory of God. So prune us. Cut it back. As painful as it is, cut it back, Lord. We want to be fully and wholly yours. In Jesus' name, amen.